Good morning. Uh, happy to see everybody here with us this morning. Um, for those of you with us from Ontario, it's a nice, crisp, sunny morning. Although, uh, you know, not hard to tell, the yucky weather is well on its way. Uh, for those of you uh, joining us from out west, obviously your sun is just coming up, so hopefully you have a nice day as well. We are in for a very interesting morning and well worth your time. As a quick reminder, I am Matthew Hart, the CEO for Longwoods and producers of these breakfast events. Uh, I do like to remind everybody that you can find me on LinkedIn and I am happy to connect with people. Even if there's no reason to connect right now, I am a strong believer in building your network. So please feel free to reach out at any time. Also, as a quick reminder, uh, tomorrow is Remembrance Day. So please do take a moment at uh, 11 a.m. to uh, remember. Um, these events are not possible without the support of our partners and without them we wouldn't be able to produce these events so supporting today's event um, i'd like to thank michelle bracken from bd jim shave from cerner bill collery from healthcare excellence canada patricia mcgregor from health pro bernard lord from medivy neil fraser from Medtronic, peter jones from microsoft and of course robin sakant from roche uh, last note before I turn it over, if you do have a question, please ask them at any time before you forget, uh, and then we can address them at the end of this session. Uh, and do please ask, ask questions in the Q&A section, because that's where our uh, speakers will go. They will try to avoid looking at the uh, chat section. Uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to David Castle. David, the show is yours. Hey, thank you very much, Matthew. So good morning, everyone. I'm David Castle. I am a professor of public administration and business at the University of Victoria uh, and a researcher in residence of the Office of the Chief Science Advisor to the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our presenter and panelists this morning. Uh, so beginning with our presenter, uh, Dr. Vivek Gol, who's the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Waterloo and is also Chair of the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy Expert Advisory Group for the Public Health Agency of Canada. In addition to uh, Vivek, we also have uh, two other members from uh, that expert advisory group. I too am a member. Uh, Ailes Maybe is an indep independent patient partner, and Ewan Atflip is senior medical advisor, health informatics of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta. So I'm looking forward to a very stimulating session with, uh, with our presenter and our, our panelists and the questions that uh, you'll pose uh, to us all uh, in the Q&A session. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Vivek, and I believe you have screen control and can take it away. Well, thank you, uh, David, and I'll just get my slides uh, started. Um, I think, as David noted, we are all members of this expert advisory group, uh, which is working with the Public Health Agency of Canada, as well as uh, a number of federal departments, Health Canada, um, Statistics Canada, Indigenous Services Canada, CAIHI and CIHR, uh, along with the Federal Provincial Territorial um, Conference of Deputy Ministers on um, developing these concepts around a pan-Canadian health data strategy. Um, I don't think I need to explain to this group why um, there's motivation for looking at this yet again um, as we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, back in um, June of 2020, there was a commitment as part of the Safe Restart Agreement to develop a pan-Canadian health data strategy so we wouldn't face headlines such as this again in a, in a future pandemic. Um, and you, know, you don't have to be bilingual to know what this headline here is about. And the reality is in many parts of the country, we continue to use faxes to move patient information around. And it's a theme we'll come up back to because fax is a digital form of paper and, and much of our digital strategy continues to be driven uh, on procedures and processes built around paper. This is a busy slide, but I, we put it up because it really highlights um, the issue for Canada uh, in, in a very simple way. Um, this is around sharing of viral sequences to GISIAD, which is the global repository of, uh, for genome sequences, and it's been used for depositing the SARS-CoV-2 sequences, and that's how we are able to track the emergence and spread of variants. 
And so at the bottom, we have how many sequences have been completed by May 27th. And this is at different countries, you probably can't read it, but United Kingdom is at the top here. And Canada has is, is essentially a global leader, if we think about it on a per capita basis, in creating the sequences from the viruses. What the top part is showing is how long it takes for those sequences to get deposited and for the information, the metadata to be complete. And the UK is at the top and that's why they keep picking out the variants. It's not that the variants are uh, occurring more in the UK, it's they're better at sequencing it and sharing the data and turning it into meaningful information. Um, and Canada is quite the laggard in here. And you know we're there with Argentina and Iceland and the Philippines in how long we're taking to get our sequences out. So in the UK, the medium time is about 15 days. In, for Canada, it approaches close to 90 days. Um, and, and so that in a nutshell is our problem. We don't, it's not the lack of data, it's turning it into information and it's sharing it, whether it's sharing within across organizations, across jurisdictions within Canada or to global databases such as GCAD. This graphic really reflects our current situation. Um, we do have a lot of data sitting in silos, um, acute public health, mental health, primary care, research tends to be separate. Um, patients are starting to get visibility on their data through portals, but they usually have to have multiple portals in order to get access to their information. And there's, it's not easy to move data across the silos it's not easy to move data across organizations or across jurisdictions, provinces, and territories and sharing with the federal government. And, and in essence, our problem, as I said, is that we continue to have the framework that we had, a policy framework for holding data, for sharing data developed in the analog era. And so we have this concept of custodians, health information custodians in every provincial territorial uh, privacy, health privacy legislation. And that's literally around custodians of paper records. So when I was a medical student in that era, I would go to the medical records room, usually in the basement, and there would be a human custodian of the data that would hand over the chart of the patient. And they would be custodians for each type of data, lab data, primary care data, the provider or the entity, the organization doing it. Where we're at today is we've developed digital systems, but our policy framework remains fixed in that analog era. And so we have health information custodians for digital data on a model of physical records. So we've started to have some access and some sharing but there's still a lot of barriers related to that analog model. And so what we really wanna to work towards is a future state where our policy framework is also right for the digital era as we continue to move our technologies forward. And what we wanna to work towards is a future state where we have a person-centered design, just like we wanna have person-centered healthcare, put people right at the center of it simplify our data sharing so that we can move things around while protecting privacy and confidentiality um, and streamline rules for data sharing, for research, for public health and health system oversight. And one thing I really wanna emphasize is these are not secondary uses. We often get caught up in primary and secondary use. These are all primary uses of the data, whether it's improving care for the individual or improving the system to benefit individuals, generating research, which will generate uh, innovations that will benefit individuals or public health protecting the health of people. In our first report, and the link to that has been posted up, we summarized 60 years of reports on this topic because we know what the barriers to achieving what we are talking about are. We've known them for many years, and uh, we know what we need to do to overcome this. And what 
we really are starting to focus on as we work on our second and third report, which will be out in the, in the coming months, is what we need to do to overcome the barriers we identified in the first report. And these are the themes that we are looking at. And what I'll emphasize is we're looking at public trust and data literacy. If we don't engage the public and work with them, we won't resolve the kinds of issues that uh, we've faced. We need our data policies to be modernized. As I said, we need them to be equitable to ensure that all communities, all individuals benefit uh, from the data. We need clear and accountable data governance across within organizations, across organizations and across jurisdictions. And I know that's easier said than done. And we need data interoperability in architecture. And I, we put this last because that's where we tend to go. We tend to think about what systems we need to build, uh, we, what systems we need to procure. Those are important things. But if we don't work on these first three elements, we can invest all the resources and we've lot, got lots of case studies from uh, past years of experience of people ma investing massive amounts of money in trying to procure single systems without focusing in on these elements. And the great thing as we move uh, forward with the technologies available, we don't actually need to have everyone working on a single system anymore. If we can get our accountabilities and governance right for how we set our standards and our, for sharing data, then um, we can have people working on different systems and bringing data together in cloud-based systems that can protect privacy and enable sharing. A critical success factor is moving from the model of health information custodians to data stewardship. And this is a model that's been uh, developed in, in several jurisdictions in uh, Europe and the UK, and I, is very much um, being looked at uh, by many jurisdictions in Canada. And really what we are, would take is take the individuals that are health information custodians or privacy officers and have them have clear mandates where they do have to assure the protection of the data, uh, for sure protection of privacy and confidentiality, but they also have a mandate to assure its use and to make it available, to make it available for sharing, for linkages, so that we can benefit the public. We can benefit individual patients, but we can also benefit through those shared uses that we described earlier. And if we pull all these elements together, um, better governance and stewardship, engagement of the public and the communities, we can work towards better system management and improved health outcomes. So I'm gonna pause there and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Elise, uh, to bring her perspective. Thanks, Vivek. Um, first of all, I just want to say as a patient partner, I'm very honored to be part of this expert advisory group. And I consider the work some of the most important work um, that I've ever been engaged in. My background, as was noted in the bio, is in technology, um, designing and implementing CRM systems and others. Uh, and this all happened um, during a time of digital transformation. So I've experienced all the attendant fears and resistance that go along with that. So I wanna talk about the changing public perceptions as I see it. As Canadians, we've made several assumptions. One is that our healthcare system is amongst the best in the world and we're very rightly proud of it. But as patients and caregivers, we encounter some of the real issues in our system. With COVID, however, it's clear that more of us put our, see our system as fragile and with the deep fault lines that are occurring. And I think that's shaken people's faith in the system. The other assumption is the, that we assume that change is really slow in healthcare. But then, wow, woo, the rapid switch to virtual care has demonstrated the system can indeed move quickly. And this has really reset public expectations about how quickly the system can change if there is political will. And another assumption we have is that our data is already been used for the greater good. I always thought it was. 
uh, for health system planning and for public health and all of those things. But it's clear to many of us as we, as we track what's happening with COVID that this is actually not the case. Data sharing is neither smooth nor timely. For example, my local hospital in the early days took two weeks to get COVID res test results back. And when, uh, when we looked at it, we discovered that it was because the third party uh, test provider was faxing the results back to the hospital, which manually input them. Um, that's all been automated now, but really faxes in this day and age, my God. Anyway, what do we see for the future? We see, as Vivek was saying, a person-centered integrated care, and that really is sort of the byword these days amongst those of us, particularly patient partners. We see a system that uses data and modern technology in the manner that we expect from other industries. To get there, we need to rethink the system, not rejig it. It means having a vision for the whole and a lot of the work that we've been doing as a group has been around that vision and, uh, and looking at a blueprint for making that vision uh, possible. It's not enough to sort of bolt on virtual care and other digital supports to a historically disjointed system because that means that we don't allow for the real great advantages you can get from a digital system. The other thing we need is to support a person-centric person -centric care. If that's what we want, we need the infrastructure, the foundation in the appropriate policies and the data architecture to support it. Without these supports, providers and patients will continue to swim upstream against the current of provider-centric data architecture and policies from a bygone era. We need to make it easy for people to participate in their wellness and health. And a lot of people want that. This would require, for instance, that I have one instance of me, not the multiple me's I currently have access to through portals in our current provider-centric system. I need all my information in one place, including wellness app data, dental information, my massage therapist, my psychologist, and so on. This is the data that people need to manage their health and wellness. And this is data from a person-centric perspective. So as Canadians, we also need and expect the same services, no matter where we are or how we travel around the country. And borders can be artificial barriers when care is on the table. It is harmful and indeed criminal to let jurisdictional boundaries become barriers to care. Finally, I'll leave you with two additional thoughts. The first is the private sector has ramped up its offerings during COVID. And I know of people who are jumping ship to go private and are not waiting for the public system to offer what they want. I think none of us want the public system to be eroded because it didn't adopt the current features that we all expect, like from banking and Amazon and the like. And we're pressed for time. Secondly, the public needs to be involved in the transformation, as Vivek said, this is so important. And for the involvement of the public to be robust, the public needs greater health literacy and greater data health literacy. The effort to do this needs to be coordinated at a national level so that we all understand the same language and the same concepts. We need this now and we need to work together with the public. And it's all about the public because in fact, we pay for the system, we experience the system and we should indeed be helping to co-design our system. So that's it for my remarks and I'll hand it over now to you. And Thank you very much, Elise. I really appreciate it. And uh, I will echo Elise's um, sentiments about um, this work being really important. And, and yeah, it's been a great pleasure and honor to serve on the expert advisory group for the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy. What is fascinating about it is it's brought together uh, individuals from many, many sort of um, um, perspectives and with many expertise levels of expertise in different things. So, so it's really been, been a pleasure to work with, with them all. 
So I'm going to um, build off what Vivek and, and Elise have spoken to here and um, really talk. So, so I'll contextualize this. I'm, I, I'm a, a physician who still works part-time providing clinical service, but I'm also a health informatician, as David said at the outset. So I sort of combine, I straddle these two world, worlds of clinical care. And, um, and health information system policy and design and deployment. So I'm gonna start with a simple story that, that, that occurred at the very outset of my career to, to sort of illustrate what we're talking about. Um, I, when I graduated from McGill in 1992, I traveled to, uh, I began working in Nunavut in the Northwest, in, in Nunavik, pardon me, in a place called Salawit on the Hudson Strait opposite Cape Dorset. And um, one day I had a case, I was new, young, and I was an experiment in that I was put in a nursing station permanently as a physician. They were distributing physicians in, in, in that area of Canada's north. Um, and so I was sort of terrified. <laughs> I didn't quite know what I was doing. And um, I had a child brought in who was about you know six weeks old uh, who had been dropped on, on a concrete step by mistake. Um, and had bilateral cephalohematomas. So these sort of goose eggs had bled into the scalp and the scalp is very vascular and you bleed a lot. So we did an X-ray and in nursing stations at that time, it was usually the janitor who did the X-rays. And, um, and I looked at the X-ray and there were these lines on the scalp and I couldn't figure out if these were, were um, sutures, which children have uh, that, that, that sort of gaps in the, or, or non-fused skull bones um, that allow them to, to go down the birth canal that fuse over the first six to eight months of life, or if they were fractures, skull fractures. And I looked in textbooks, but I had no way to figure this out. And my choice was whether to send this child by medevac to Montreal or Ottawa, or to uh, keep them. Uh, and the implications of a bilateral skull fracture are significant. Um, so I traced this image on, on, on a piece of paper and faxed it, uh, as Elise has said in Vivek, people faxed it to some radiologist in Montreal who laughed and said, I'm really terrible at drawing, uh, which is true. Um, so um, ultimately I kept the child thinking they were just uh, sutures and um, I was wrong when the x-ray came back uh, two weeks later, it was bilateral skull fractures. The point here is that the exchange of information um, equates to safety and to our capacity to do our jobs. I put this patient in an unsafe situation through my lack of knowledge and through the lack of capacity to exchange knowledge virtually with someone who could have told me in 20 seconds whether these were sutures or fractures. This is happening continuously. When I go on call on Friday at Stanton Hospital in Yellowknife, I will face the same issues. This has not changed much in healthcare. I will face the same issues. We cannot transport MRIs or, or digitally send MRIs or CTs or just about anything down to the specialists we rely on in Alberta. And um, it's, it's 30 years later. And this is impacting patient safety. So I want to talk about what Vivek and, and Elise have spoken about in terms of harm. So when we consider there is harm implicit in our misuse of patient, of, of health information, not strictly personal health information, all forms of health information. And what are those harms? Well, there's a threat to the physical and mental health and well-being of patients, as I've just illustrated. There's a threat to the security and privacy of their health information, and we all know about that. There's lots of policy and legislation around that. And there is compromise of our legal prerogative of, of the patient as the owner of their personal health information to honor that. So those are sort of the types of harm. So what, how do we approach these types of harm? And as Vivek said in his slide with exchanging information, you know, the, it, it's obstructed and this can result in harm, both obstructed on an individual level, but obstructed as his illustration with COVID uh, on a level when we take population-based data, we can't share it as well internationally, we can't share it between jurisdictions, we have all kinds of obstacles. His point being the data is there, but we have trouble consolidating it, pooling it and sharing it. 
that, and it's the same on a discrete level for patient care. What's interesting is if you examine the policy environment around this, we have ample policy around privacy security and everyone understands that. We basically have a lacuna of policy around patient safety or patient ownership of data or control of data. We largely disregard these. And it's quite shocking when you think of it. We've basically, in the digital era since 1989 and the launch of the World Wide Web, conducted a 30-year experiment on Canadians where we have not adopted a culture or a policy and governance environment that, that, that embraces a culture of safety, physical and mental health safety, around health data and health information. If you consider what the Canada Health Act says, it says our obligation is to protect, promote and restore the physical and mental well-being of residents of Canada. Well, I think we're defaulting on our obligation to that because we're not doing that in our use of data or health information. And all of us, whether one is a health researcher, in government, in management, in education, or a clinician working on, on, in a hospital or in a clinic, rely on health information, whether in a pooled or population-based uh, um, form or in a discrete individual form to inform our decisions. And if we are missing that information or if we un are unable to exchange it, we are defaulting on our obligation to the Canada Health Act. And this, and I'll finally, you know, get uh, return to Vivek's points around custodial model or, or the service centric model that Elise was referring to. In my practice as a clinician, starting from my time in Nunavik uh, to working in Nunavut, to working in the Northwest Territories and being the CMIO of the Northwest Territories, building integrated charting systems and now working largely in policy in this area, it has become evident to me, as Vivek said, the real obstacle is not technology. The obstacle is a deeply fragmented and dysfunctional policy and governance environment in healthcare around digital health. Um, and so that is what we need to solve. The technology does what we want it to do, right? But we're bound by this and cust the custodial model puts the power over health information in discrete individual service-based packets. And consequently, the technology we've designed has followed those packets. And then we, we disincent the sharing of information between those entities rather than incenting. Imagine if we said, <laughs> it, you are at fault if you don't share this information because you will be harming people. We don't say that. We say you will be uh, violating privacy if you do share it. And we don't seem to care whether it actually harms people on an individual basis or through the power of research and the power of effective management and population and public health to use the pooled data to inform us how to be better in the business. So that is what is necessary. And this is really the work that we're driving. So I think we owe the citizens of Canada within the scope of our management of data to reimagine, as Elise said, it's a rethinking. I think she used the term rethink, to reimagine our approach. It's not, and because the, the failure is we continue to work within our antiquated policy environment and it is failing us and we are failing uh, everyone. So we have to rethink this. And the last thing I will say is people say we're bound by the Constitution and the Federals and so forth. Nothing in the Constitution of Canada or in the Canada Health Act or anything stops us from aligning ourselves around a comprehensive patient-centric digital age policy environment, except our, the only thing that's stopping us is our will to do so. So that is an excuse. And it, uh, and it it should stop. We need alignment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ewan and Elisa and Vivek. Um, so we've 
we've uh, heard lots now about um, some of the, the problems and the and the and the challenges, and certainly uh, I think everyone would like to know a little bit more about how we can uh, move from what I think you've described as a bit of an inverted world in which we've we've got a preoccupation with data architecture, perhaps an unhealthy preoccupation with uh, 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 particular interpretations of of uh, privacy. Um, and we don't have perhaps all of the right incentives in place that, that we would like to see. So each of you brings um, your own uh, professional expertise to this, this table. Um, Vivek is a, a public health expert, Elias is a patient advocate, and you, Ewan, is somebody who has worked in rural and remote areas and is a physician and a CIO. I'd like to just hear before we turn to the questions about what you, what you think might be different this time. What is it about this point in, in, in time, maybe perhaps brought on uh, or recontextualized by COVID or uh, the advent of different types of digital technologies and how uh, people are viewing themselves uh, with respect to their, their technological uh, enablement of the things that they're interested in uh, around their, their personal care. So I'd like to go back to you, uh, Viva, and ask you, What's what's different about this time? You you alluded to sixty years of yeah. of of reports, and and we haven't quite got to where we ought to be. Yeah, and uh, David, that's a great question, and I think I can also address the first one in the Q and A, uh, which is along these lines as well. The um, the first thing when I was asked if I would take this on uh, in spring of twenty twenty, um, the people that were asking me very senior people in the federal government, I said, have you read the Martin Wilk report, which was a 1991 report by the, at the retired chief statistician. Um, we have a quote from his report at the start of our, our first report. And you could read that entire report. And as Ewan said, nothing's changed in 30 years. All the findings and all the recommendations are what we're seeing today. And, and, and so that was my initial reaction. Why do you need me to bring together a group to do yet another report. And you know, I think the key thing was that as a result of COVID, um, and as we've seen many things in the world have changed, as uh, at least refer to the move to virtual care, right? We have changed our attention and people have become data junkies. Like they want, they want the numbers every day. They want to know how many people are in ICU, how many people are vaccinated, and all of a sudden. We're not able to answer the questions that people are asking that the media are asking. And so I think we have a moment in time where we do have a level of attention from the public, from the media, from our governments um, that we haven't had. And, and I, I'm hoping that we can have a difference. It's, it's even greater. You know, we have another quote from David Naylor's report after SARS. I think the level of attention is even greater than we had after SARS. And we can explain things that we're talking about with very concrete examples. And so, you know, I take the issue around certification of vaccination systems. And, and, and you know, people say, well, it's simple. We, we have technology on our phones that should have allowed for us to have the barcodes. And, you know, the response is the reason we don't have a uniform national or international system is not because we don't have the technology. As Ewan held up his phone, he said, the technology would do it. We didn't have the systems of governance and accountability amongst our federal, provincial, territorial partners to start to say early enough a year ago when people started to raise the questions, the vaccines are coming, we're going to have the rollout, we're going to need systems like this. And, you know, the let's be honest, like the buck was kind of passed. Is it a federal responsibility? Is it a provincial responsibility? Is it up to everyone administering vaccine to issue the certifications? And, and so we were, you know, we're left with the systems not being there because we didn't have the accountability. So my hope is that with the attention that we have, and as we start to release these reports, and there's also an alignment there's a lot of work being done on the digitalization of health. And what we're seeing is a lot of the issues that we're raising are aligning with the issues being raised there. Um, there's a lot of work on data governance more broadly, whether it's 
First Nations data governance. Um, there's the issues around data governance in relation to the big tech companies. Federal government has uh, legislation coming in around that. So I think there's a moment in time where if we get things all lined up, we can bring about the kind of change that's been difficult to do. But I will say it's not gonna be easy. It is gonna require collaboration across levels of government and across healthcare providers and different levels of organization. And as many people are saying, it's gonna involve a level of public engagement and public discourse as well as provider engagement and discourse with the providers. And that's why we have public and provider data literacy high in our list of recommendations that we're working on, because without that level of engagement, we'll face the failure. And you know, I get asked, you know, what's, what's the worst outcome for this work is that in 30 years, someone will write another report and put a quote from our report at the front of their report. And we have to avoid that from happening. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Much as we love being cited, that's <laughs> not what we're here for, right? Um, so uh, anyway, same, same sort of question. What's different about it this time? And I noticed there was a question in the Q&A section that referred to just public becoming more informed. And the question is contextualized around long-term care. Uh, but maybe more generally, from your perspective, is there is there something in the in the uh, public awareness that's growing that will act as a as a driver for change? And if you answer that, then I'll I'll ask the sim similar sort of question uh, of you. And and there's a there's a question in the Q and A there about explaining the importance of health data to people who don't don't do research. Um, uh, and maybe don't have the same set of eyes on these these issues as as researchers uh, who are also clinicians. So over to you, Ailis. Yeah, so um, I think that because of COVID, people have been paying a lot more attention. People who normally um, are very complacent about the health system, but this is impacting everybody. There's nobody that is um, not affected by it in some way, shape or form. If nothing else, we're all affected by the restrictions. Um, so people are paying attention. And as Vivek said, we're tracking, most of the people I know are really tracking all the statistics. And my friends and family who know that I'm uh, involved in healthcare, they're often asking me questions about it. So there's a huge heightened awareness. And as I said earlier, you know, um, the fault lines in our system, long-term care is such a great example. I think people were horrified. We are a society that does tend to sort of shunt the aged away and parcel them off into long-term care and so on, <clears throat> says I being one of those people that might just be shunted soon. <laughs> but, you know, we're used to that out of sight, out of mind, but then all of a sudden it was no longer out of mind. It was heart-wrenching, it was shameful, it was horrific and people don't want this to occur. I think we're all embarrassed and ashamed by what has happened and we want that to change. So I think the appetite for change has been heightened by unfortunately some of these horrible things that have happened and by our sort of united experience of having to deal with the pandemic. So I agree with Vivek, I think we've got a window of change and we really need to drive through it because we won't get another opportunity like this hopefully, in, in a thousand years at the rate we're going. You want me to comment, David? Yes, please. Um, and if you can link it back to that, that there's a question about you know, incentives, but also just this issue of uh, varying degrees of familiarity and comfort with working with, with data. Yeah, which sort of speaks to literacy. So with respect to, to why this is a moment, you know, for, for myself, as I illustrated 30 years ago, I became, I, I, I identified on a very discreet level my, my dependence on information to provide care. And incidentally, the, the six, month, six week old did well, even though I was wrong, but the, the likelihood of an intracranial hemorrhage was substantially more. So one would probably want to transport them out, which I didn't do, but in any case, uh, they, I was lucky and, and so were they in that instance. Um, so, you know, what's, what's happened is, is 
you know, I think we've had a love affair with technology and been seduced by it. It's manifest by organizations like Singularity University out of California and all these people saying, you know, we're going to AI and virtual care and all this stuff are going to save us and so forth and so on. And we, we, we haven't recognized the problem as Vivek articulated, which is that the, the ground on which we're planting this technology has been completely and utterly infertile. You know, if, if Mark Zuckerberg, whether you, <laughs> whether you like Facebook or not, it's sort of nefarious, but it is an example of an exceedingly successful networked environment, perhaps the, the greatest example. If you told Mark Zuckerberg that you, he has to build Facebook, um, but break it up and create a different instance that is fragmented, not interoperable uh, in each community in Canada or around the world, what would be the value of his capacity to, to consolidate data to drive things like Cambridge Analytica and the various things, or, or to uh, exchange information over time and location and seduce people into using it? Well, it, the value proposition would be gone, but that is the model we have used, right? And the, the, so what has happened is our, the admixture of digital technology and analog policy has resulted in deep chaos in the environment now. I have never seen the levels of burnout that I am seeing now in COVID. This was happening before COVID. It's just sort of the cherry on the top. Um, we spend about 40 cents on every Canadian dollar nationally on healthcare. No one knows quite to do. We're driving huge cost. Nurses want to leave the profession. Physicians want to leave the profession. Um, other healthcare workers it's it's it, so so there is a necessity at this point in time to begin engaging with a reimagined process. I think there's a sense of desperation and governance are being leached of, of dollars. So and we, as David Naylor has pointed out in the innovation report, we are really good at innovating. Like Vivek said, we're good at collecting data, but consolidating that and uh, scale and spread is our problem. And what's happening is our governance our fragmented governance is impairing scale and spread. So this is, um, it's a chaotic environment and, and COVID and, and the, the value of virtualization for someone such as I who's been saying, you know, for the Canada's North, virtualization is, is a remarkable opportunity to bring in knowledge and expertise and drive equity that is unparalleled. And 30 years later, we're dependent on the facts and telemedicine and or video conferencing and so forth largely isn't working we're still struggling it, it's it's quite remarkable so that gets to your second point david is you know our, our relationship to data i think there's a profound and deep lack of literacy i think as elise alluded to and maybe vivek as well in the environment one reason we have not been able to identify governance and policy is the real problem is is that we do not educate ourselves, um, certainly with respect to healthcare providers, to understand the importance of our relationship to health data and health information and how it informs basically everything we do. Um, and so we have separated data management and, and, and like sequestered it in, in public health and population health and so forth. And those of us who are providing care and generate a lot of the, certainly the personal health information have a cursory or uh, relationship to it. And then same with those in positions of authority who are making decisions are bound to this aged custodial model and, and, and the, the, the federal model and, and believe that we have to adhere to it. Uh, and we're just damaging ourselves. So a deep lack of literacy um, is, is driving our incapacity to, to reimagine ourselves. And I think that that needs to change. Great, thanks. Thanks, you. And I, I noticed um, uh, that one of our uh, audience members has re-upped the question on uh, uh, cybersecurity. And I don't think we can get into that in, in depth today, but of course, uh, so cybersecurity has been an issue for uh, for uh, as long as we've had digital records. It's only worsening. So I think that this is a point well made in the question that we'll have to we'll have to attend to this. There's one other question here, which is about um, should we push for a federally 
uh, governed Canadian health care uh, care system, um, and is our current system seriously outdated? I, I would turn that back to uh, the, the you know the owners of this forum, Longwoods, to perhaps invite us back um, after we've released another couple of reports and our final our final report to have that very conversation. I think that's an excellent uh, point on which we could uh, uh, we could perhaps think through about what. Uh, what a new model of, of uh, health information governance in Canada could look like and what its implication uh, implications might be for the way that the table is currently set and if we need to move in, in some other sorts of directions. So um, a very nice question. Uh, we'd love to answer it another day. And I see that Matthew has uh, reappeared and so I'll turn the uh, floor back over to you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. That was a, a, a very engaging and uh, interesting conversation. And um, I have to agree with David. I think once um, report two comes out and possibly possibly we do one after each report, who knows? Uh, I, I will talk with the group and we'll see how we move forward on that. Uh, there were a number of questions that we weren't necessarily able to address. I will forward them off um, to the speakers so that they can at least see what, what we're what we're being asked, and then maybe they can address on Twitter or on social media or something to that effect. Um, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, we will be having uh, more breakfast shortly. Please keep your eye out for uh, Leslie Thompson, the president and CEO for the Health Standards Organization, Kevin Smith, uh, CEO for UHN. Uh, as well, we'll be having Matthew Anderson, president and CEO for Ontario Health. Uh, so keep your eyes out for those. Other than that, have a fantastic day, and uh, we'll see everybody soon. Bye-bye.